Hello and welcome to the 201st edition of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm the professor, Matt Perkins. And a deep post across the Harpeth River from me here in the Music City, and coming off of a big homecoming victory over Antioch, it's our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton. What's up, guys? Um, Teddy Roosevelt would have been proud at our football game um, last Friday. It was a rainy, sloppy mud fest that featured uh, two attempted passes with no completions uh, for us. Uh, Antioch uh, actually completed more passes than us, but we ran the ball 99.9%, and that is probably a legitimate statistic. So I loved it, man, but I love being with, uh, with you guys even more. Coach, I bet the happiest kids at the end of that game was your offensive line. Because there's nothing an uh, offensive lineman loves more than just being able to run block on every single play. Yeah, my center was like, uh, Coach Burton, are we ever going to pass? Um, we've been run blocking for quite some time now. Uh, can we get some like pass blocking in or, or something? I go, I said, direct, uh, I said directly to him, I go, listen, you're an offensive lineman. You should never ask about passing the ball. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, because when you're pass blocking, you're trying not to lose. But when you're run blocking, like you can win, you know. And it, oh, it, yeah. it's 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 a very different thing. Anyway, before we get too deep into the weeds of offensive line play, uh, let's uh, introduce the third amigo in the second city, a man who's offered to drive Brian Ferentz to the Eastern Iowa Regional Airport. It's our intrepid vlogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook. He, he's awful. He's awful. Nine points in seven quarters. Uh, Nate Stanley, two games without a touchdown pass until one in pretty much garbage time against Penn State. They Which required can, uh, the receiver <clears throat> mossing the defensive yeah, back and making I mean, probably the catch of the weekend. They can barely cross midfield. And, uh, I mean, they had a first and goal at, like, the three-yard line. Got three points out. Like, what are they doing? Nothing. It's an abomination. It's an awful offense. Uh, any other coach I think in the country would have stripped Brian Ferentz from play calling duties, would have just had him coaching the position group, uh, and then at the end of the year probably reassess things. But because it's the head coach's son, he's pretty much the coach in waiting, and it's a disaster. Yeah, it is. Did not look pretty against Penn State, Josh. You were at that game. We we're going to talk about it here in just a minute. Um, this show in particular is going to be a little bit different than our uh, typical show. Uh, it's basically the midpoint of the college football season here in 2019. So we're going to do a, a, a midpoint review. I do these with my students at my school. And so we're going to do one here on the pod. Uh, just uh, sort of see, check in with uh, all the different conferences see what's going on um and uh we'll just sort of give our thoughts you know maybe on touching on the games uh from this past weekend and this coming weekend but uh just sort of trying to take a step back and you know have a thirty-five thousand foot view of uh the uh you know college football as a whole and so we'll start uh in the sec because coach unfortunately uh your dogs lost uh in the probably the biggest upset of the season uh, so far against South Carolina. Now, Coach, you rightly so predicted South Carolina to cover. Not only did they do that, they won outright in what was just a sloppy, sloppy game for Georgia, four turnovers. So, I mean, where do you even want to start? I don't know where to start, but uh, both teams didn't want to win that game. Uh, it was probably one of the worst games ever. Um, South Carolina was down to a third-string quarterback. Um they didn't hardly move the ball. They only scored 10 points um, offensively. Uh, and they I felt like they scored 10 points offensively. Jake Fromm gave them seven himself. And I, I never felt like uh, a 17-10 game was more out of reach than this one uh, because it Georgia somehow amassed 500 yards. I, I don't know where. Um, they just could not. They just could not move the ball against South Carolina. South Carolina had a hell of a game plan. 
um, against them defensively. Uh, their defensive line, uh, Javon Kinlaw, uh, led, did a tremendous job stopping the run. They did a tremendous job getting after Jake Fromm. Secondary played really, really well all day uh, in man coverage, uh, press man. Uh, those receivers couldn't get any separation. Um, it was almost as if they had Georgia's playbook. Oh, wait. Uh, no, it, they just kept calling the same play over and over and over and over again. And they kept um, – the pattern in which they called a uh, run and pass was also extremely predictable. So as a defensive coordinator, Will Muschamp could say, oh, well, um, they're going to run on first and second down. All right, let's dial up our run blitzes. All right, they're going to they're gonna throw it on third down. All right, let's dial up our stunts and then rinse and repeat. And so um, that was extremely frustrating. Um, we could pick apart each turnover um, as to what happened. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is our receivers aren't great at getting separation and running routes. Our quarterback had a horrible day. Our offensive line um, got beat most of the day. Our running game couldn't get going consistently. They called the same run about 50 times. Uh, defensively, they played – Defense played really well other than a couple of uh, – other than getting beat on a double move and, and a couple of third and longs that they got adjusted. Um, you know, they played pretty well. But Kirby Smart uh, really coached really coached poorly, especially at the end of regulation. I don't know why you don't kick the – try the 55-yard field goal with, with, uh, with Hot Rod with eight seconds to go. I, I, I don't know. I probably would have just said, all right, let's just go ahead and get it now. He's clutch. Let, let's let's go get it. So, um, I don't really know which trail to go down. So, Matt, I'm gonna let you. Uh, I'm gonna let you guide me if you want to. Otherwise, uh, we can we can move on. So, it's up to you, though. My big takeaway from this game wasn't just the really vanilla offense that Georgia displayed, but um, you know, a, a, as bad as they look, they still have everything to play for they can still win out and go to the sec title game and they win the sec title game they go you know you know they're going to make they're going to make the playoff but i don't i mean i also think it puts a it also it's going to put an interesting spin on the cocktail party this year but i think oddly enough the team that's hurt most by this loss is not georgia but it's notre dame um, because that was their signature game so far was that they played Georgia close. And now Georgia loses in the same stadium that Notre Dame lost Georgia in. Georgia loses to South Carolina. Uh, and, you know, uh, Notre Dame's only other shot for a big marquee matchup for the rest of the season is going to be Michigan. And Michigan, after this weekend against Penn State, doesn't really, you know, uh, Penn State's favored by, I think, double digits against them this weekend. And, um, you know, assuming that Penn State wins that one, Michigan's not going to be looking like that strong of an opponent either. So, strangely enough, this uh, this win by South Carolina was a huge uh, blow to uh, Notre Dame's uh, hopes of sneaking into the playoffs somehow. Yeah, I agree totally with that too. Uh, I think that um, Notre Dame is probably sitting there thinking, "Come on, Georgia, really?" Yeah. And- uh, yeah, Georgia's got to win out. I mean, there's there's no doubt about that. They they left themselves no more margin of error. They have to um, they have to beat everybody, which includes Florida, Auburn, Missouri, Texas A and M, and then if they do all of that, uh, probably Alabama or LSU. Well, I guess that leads to the question, Josh is is LSU versus Alabama sort of the inev- uh, the d- now the de facto SEC title game? It would appear to be, yeah. But uh, I just – with these four teams, I don't know. I, I still think Georgia has a really good shot. You know, they, they have the easier division. They just need to pull an upset over Alabama or LSU, but I don't, you know – until Alabama loses, I'm always going to assume that they're going to win. Um, so LSU kind of needs to win the harder division, which isn't going to be easy. 
and then yeah. find a way to beat Georgia. It, it reminds me a little bit of the Clemson loss to Pitt. That was just a total head scratcher, and then Pitt or Clemson figured things out and mm-hmm. had a pretty good end of the season. I, and, I don't, and that was that was a home loss for Clemson too that season. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that was the year they finally to, ended up breaking through and winning yeah. the title. So yeah, I don't think it's time to uh, to publish any obituaries for Georgia's 2019 no. season. No, no, n- not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. But um, speaking of you know LSU right there, they had another big win over Florida, and I think they are the team right now that if I had a vote, I would personally vote them number one because they have done the most. They have Ooh. two sign two signature victories. Uh, Wisconsin? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I would. I think LSU is the best team in the country right now. They're the most well-rounded team in the country today. That doesn't mean I think that they will necessarily win the title. It doesn't. Even, I don't even think that that I, they will be underdogs in Tuscaloosa for good reason when they play there. What is that? The 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 ninth of November, I believe. And I anticipate you know them them losing that game but as of today they have done the most and they look the best to me so i would vote them number one um which i guess one of the questions i was going to ask you guys at some point tonight so we might as well get out of the way early i want to know uh if you guys have either a, a current top five a current top 10 a top eight is there are there any teams that have uh, do you have like a tier or a group of teams that you think are the best in the country at the moment because I have I think that there are pretty clearly I want to say six teams that uh, are you know uh, maybe a step above the rest of the competition but I'm curious what you guys think well give us your six okay so I'll go in order I think LSU is the best team in the country I think Mm -hmm. Alabama is the second best team in the country I think that Ohio State is the third best team in the country I believe that um Clemson is four Oklahoma is five Wisconsin is six and I think those six teams um I would put Georgia seven right after them but um I think I think those six teams have demonstrated that they are all of those have at least one truly elite part of their their team um whether it's Wisconsin's defense which now has four shutouts in six games um, which is uh, unheard of. Uh, it hasn't been done since 93. Uh, quick trivia question. Uh, do you, either of you guys know who the last school to uh, have four shutouts in their first six games was? Do you have a year? 93. Oh. Oh. A Lou Holtz coach Notre Dame team. Nope. Florida State. Yes. That is correct. Uh, Florida State. They were uh, national champions that year. Mm-hmm. They were yep. nasty on defense. Yep. And this Wisconsin defense is special. Um, it they, they absolutely obliterated Michigan State. And so let's just get into the Big Ten from there. Um, so now we don't get to give our top six? Okay. No. Okay. So, okay. So I, I take that back. I'm sorry. I get, uh, you know, I get a little bit excited sometimes. I know. Uh, so, yeah. No, please, uh, Josh, give me your top five to ten or whatever number you should choose. All right. Well, I don't see how you uh, can move Alabama off that top peg until someone beats them. So I'm going to okay. have Bama up there. I think body of work, it's really tough to overlook LSU's win so far. So I'm going to have them second. The rest of are going to be a little bit of a struggle to slot. I think the AP right now has Clemson. But when I look at Clemson, I just am not trusting their offense. They're not firing on all cylinders. They have not put together a truly complete game yet this season. So do I think Clemson's better than Ohio State? Well, Ohio State can score on anybody. Do I think they're better than Oklahoma? Well, Oklahoma could score on anybody. Do I think they're better than Wisconsin? Well, I think Wisconsin's defense could post a shutout. I have to go all the way to Penn State to find a team that I would say, yeah, I think Clemson's clearly better than them. 
You're right. I should have had Penn State yeah. in my. I also should have had yeah. Penn State in that tier as well. Yeah. Penn so I, really good. So I think I would have to put Clemson, who's currently third in the AP, at my six slot. That then bumps Ohio State up. Mm-hmm. I think Ohio State is more well-rounded than Oklahoma, and we'll get to see Ohio State, Wisconsin. So I'm fine with Bucky being ahead of them. And then I get Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and um, Wisconsin's offense looks so much better, but I don't know. Like defense, no, I, wins, I, I, defense I, wins champions, but but there's just uh, I need to see Cone play more than just six games. That's true, and I need to see Wisconsin sh- really shut down an elite offensive team. You know, I mean, four shutouts against any competition, against FCS competition is still outstanding. Well, speaking about, you know, these contenders and uh, some amazing, amazing defense, uh, have you guys seen the total yards allowed right now statistic? Not recently. Okay. Okay. Any guesses on who is in the top five? Wisconsin. Yes, they are. Um, Florida, LSU. Uh, not Florida. Probably Florida. I want. I, I want to say like Arizona State. No. Uh, Michigan State. No. Iowa. Oklahoma. Yes. Iowa oh. is. Um, Rutgers. <laughs> Kansas State. Oh. Like close? No. Ugh. Oregon. Yards allowed. Why? Like... I don't know. I don't know. Oregon's defense is way better this year. Oregon's defense has gotten way better. It's gotten way better this year. Yards allowed, though. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Here. Let, g- let... Yeah, g- give it to us. San Diego All State. Right. No, 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 no. You guys are silly. And speak about silliness, my computer is being really slow so matt you're gonna have to edit this oh it's okay i can um i can pull off wonders the fuck why does my computer do this why does why do you need to reload tabs periodically makes no sense get a Uh, mac that's why i have a mac that fucking is dead currently why'd you kill it (laughs) Uh, uh, so, so here's, uh, Wisconsin, here's the yards. Wisconsin. Here's the, y- here's the I, yards allowed. I just pulled it up myself. Yeah, you got Wisconsin number one, Ohio mm-hmm. State number two, Clemson number three, Penn State number four, Iowa number five. Points allowed. That's where Oregon made an appearance. Mm. So you got four of the top five are Big Ten teams, mm-hmm. and then you have Iowa, which you know foreshadowing some stuff later in the show. How the hell? Does this team have two losses if their defense is among the best in the entire freaking country? That is where that detour was headed for why I asked you guys if you knew the defensive leaders. What's even more astonishing than that? Ohio State, second place. So uh, let's just, uh, if, if we go down that, Iowa is giving up 261 a game. Penn State, 260. Clemson, 255. All basically the same. Yeah. Ohio State's giving up 234 a game. Yards allowed. Wisconsin is giving up 173. <laughs> that I mean, is wow. 61 yards less. I mean, it is a little a quarter, 25% less than Ohio State is giving up. And Ohio State is number two. It's unreal. So yeah. I've it, it, it's it is really fun to watch that defense play. That linebacking unit unit is awesome. The secondary is for once a strength um, for the Badgers. So anyway, we'll get back to them later. Um, Coach, do you have a top five to seven to 10? Ooh, um, I'll tell you who's not in there. Uh, Rutgers did not make the cut. (laughs) Uh, Florida State did not make the cut. Um, UCLA didn't make the cut. They're winning right now against Stanford as we we record. They're up 21-10 in the second quarter. That's just bad. They still don't make the cut, though. Um, yeah, they're one and five. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, Kansas, uh, they're going to fall a little short. 
Um, no, but in real, real, uh, realistically, I think uh, I agree with Josh on the sentiment that um, until someone knocks them off their perch, Alabama is and will be and shall be number one until proven otherwise. They're probably one of the more explosive offenses around. Um, they're a little bit weaker this year on defense than they've ever been, but it doesn't matter because they've got Tua, Judy, Ruggs, Devontae Smith, Najee Harris. I uh, can keep going. Uh, number two is most definitely LSU. They're the best team in the country not named Alabama. Um, I think that um, at home, on the road, whatever, they're explosive. Joe Burrow is earning himself millions and millions and millions this year. Um, he is um, he is proving more and more to be um, – he's looking like he's pulling away as the number one player uh, in the upcoming NFL draft. Pro Football Focus has him, I think – rated number one draft prospect so that's exciting uh, and they've always been dbu and they're definitely not uh, letting the country down on that grant delpit leading the charge at safety he's probably one of the most versatile dbs in the country if not the most versatile db in the country uh the the, the defensive line is getting finally getting pressure um, and uh, they're just all working together so lsu is is probably one of the most total teams um, in the country, and, and that game with Alabama is going to be extremely interesting. Um, right now, um, I think Ohio State would be my number three at this moment. They're playing better than uh, than, the, than the rest of the teams um, that are left on this list. Uh, they're just explosive uh, on offense and defense. They're just stifling. Uh, the next team is extremely uh, explosive on offense. Could play a little bit better on defense, but uh, they do well enough to win. That's Oklahoma. Jalen Hurts is putting together a Heisman campaign. He's been unbelievable since he joined uh, the Sooners in Norman. Uh, that's number five, right? Um, is that – That's count. four. That's four. That's, that's four. Okay. I yeah, I was... you, you, you gave it to Alabama, LSU, Ohio State, and Oklahoma. Okay, so my number five, um, you got to give some love to the Badgers. I don't care who you are. Shutting people out um, four times this year is quite, quite impressive. And then you have Heisman hopeful Jonathan Taylor tailback. Um, He's going to be on somebody's NFL roster next year, and I cannot wait to see him uh, tear up the NFL as well. Um, So you got to give some love to the Badgers uh, finally playing. Um, some good defense on the back end, which is something that, Matt, you've been frustrated with for a while. That's my number five. Uh, Number six, despite losing to South Carolina and having a brain fart um, at this moment, I still don't think it was a fluke. Uh, You want to talk about another stingy defense. Georgia is is doing just that. Um, The defense is not – has not been and has and will not be an issue in Athens if they can figure out if James Coley can figure out how to be a little bit more dynamic on the offensive side of the ball and figure out how to get his best playmakers in space and and try to call a more dynamic creative um, off balance game um, I think Georgia could be um, could be right up there with uh, neck and neck with Alabama LSU and Clemson and Ohio State and those crew but as of right now they're sitting at um, number six, uh, number seven. I really, really, really like the way uh, Penn State is playing. Um, they've just been incredible um, up to this point. What they did to Iowa was nothing short of amazing. Um, so I, I was really kind of impressed watching them. Um, and so I like Penn State as number seven. Uh, number eight. Um, Wait, Coach, really, you haven't mentioned Clemson yet. Yes. Here's where Clemson comes into here's where Clemson comes into play. They're extremely, they're very very talented. Trevor Lawrence is one of the best quarterbacks in the country, but right now he's not playing like he's one of the best quarterbacks in the country. I mean, sure they just dismantled Florida State, which if you rewound this thing back to 1999 and beat Florida State, that would be newsworthy of a story. But right now Florida State is uh, bottom of the barrel. They Quarterbacked really by Alex Hornibrook. Yes, there you go. Uh, Evidence JJ. Okay. Um, so anytime it, the, the, the only team they've played that's had a pulse, I feel like uh, they struggled and almost lost. So right now they just have not been tested. And I just don't feel like they've been playing worthy, um, worthy of one of those top spots. But 
um, if the committee were to expand to an eight-team playoff, uh, leaving them out would be criminal uh, just based on how talented and what the potential they have is. They're just going to have to keep showing me, um, and I don't know where on the schedule uh, they can. I, I guess blowing out Louisville will help. Um, they just well, I guess start, that's they actually a, start blowing everybody out. Well, I guess that's a natural segue then. And then because – my, my next question is, in the ACC, is there anyone that can push Clemson? And is that potential someone Louisville? They've, you know, uh, I, I've got to say, uh, Scott Satterfield, as expected, is doing a pretty amazing job here in his first season there. He's, a, he's improving rapidly, honestly. <sighs> I mean, they uh, are, right now, they are playing right now like the second best team in the ACC. Yeah, they, they <laughs> took it to a very, very talented, uh, overachieving Wake Forest team. Uh, who I thought was going to be a team that could potentially give Clemson some fits. Um, and that's another team that I really like in, in this conference. Also, I mean, this is this is a cop-out answer, but they could have been maybe in some ways should have lost to, to North, North Carolina. Carolina. So really any of these teams could beat them because they're the team with the target on the back. Everyone wants to beat them in the ACC. And they're just not terribly sharp this year. No, something so, has been yeah. off with them so far. Yeah. But Well, I think it's because uh, I've been hearing some rumors that Dabo Sweeney is heading to the Washington Redskins. Really? Well, okay, so this is an inside joke uh, for Deadspin readers. Uh, someone in the comment thread said it'd be really funny to mention that on every article related to the Washington Redskins. And now whenever there's anything about how <laughs> awful Dan Snyder is or about Clemson football, most of the comments are, well, I hear that Dab was going to the Washington Redskins. It's become an inside joke on Deadspin, and I thought I would bring it to our podcast. I miss I, I miss that in the comment section. Yeah. I feel uh, a little. They bit are totally they are totally unsubstantiated rumors. Oh, they but were, they will become <laughs> substantiated very quickly. That was the goal by the Deadspin commenters, so we want to keep that going. <laughs> I can get behind that hundred percent. Well, there you have it, Dabo to the Redskins. That makes sense. It does for yeah. everyone. Go Redskins. <laughs> yeah, and then. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, and then uh, there, Brent well, then Venable steps in to be the head coach. Bada bing, bada yeah. boom. Everything keeps, you know, chugging right along. Well, Matt, since we're supposed to be doing a halfway point, since you brought up a question about the ACC, should we just do a little uh, snapshot of the ACC here at? Yeah, might six? as well. For six games in for these. Might teams? as might as well. Yeah. Yeah. So a ACC uh, here at Atlantic, Clemson Tigers, on top. They're the only undefeated team in the league. In fact, they're the only ranked team in the league. Oh. Um, uh, newsflash, the American has more ranked teams than the ACC. And there we go. that doesn't even factor in UCF, who is now out of the rankings after losing two games. Is that bad? It's not good. It's definitely Iowa, not good. Iowa lost two games and is still on the polls. I wouldn't want to play UCF. No. No, nor would I. Nor would I. But uh, anyhow, Louisville has come alive. They are second in their division, four and two overall, two and one in conference. Uh, Florida State, Wake Forest, uh, and NC State are all at 500 in conference. Uh, BC and Syracuse bringing up the rear, uh, both at three and three, both have been a little bit disappointing over in the coastal. Um, it's a three way tie between, oh, it's the Dukies. Be- between the Dukies, UVA, and North Carolina. Um, at all at two one in conference, Pitts one and one, Virginia Tech one and two, and has not looked good. Um, at all, uh, Miami one and two, and lowly, lowly Georgia Tech, um, Oof. is one of the worst. Uh, they really are a rambling wreck. <laughs> they are a rambling wreck. No defense. Not much and offense. <laughs> not much offense. It's not. It's just. It's not pretty. Oh. It's. It's not pretty. Like, None – I mean, what teams do you think could be considered happy with their performance so far this season? Wait, well, uh, you know, Clemson's still going yeah, okay. to be pleased because they're in the playoff race. Wake Forest – Yeah, but they've been a little bit disappointing from where yeah, expectations but, were, not going to lie. But, like, but they're 6-0 and, oh and they no, have of one course. of the best defenses of the country. Of course. I, I, yeah. But they're, they're still not, you know, necessarily – 
Uh, no, I think I think okay. everyone I think yeah, everyone no. is pleased, but Dabo, who's looking for his exit strategy to go to the Washington Redskins. Okay. <laughs> I think Clemson's happy. I think LSU. I think Louisville is thrilled. Excuse me. Uh, Wake Forest is thrilled. Uh, I think NC State getting to four and two at the halfway point. I think that's maybe a little bit better than they were expecting. They had a lot of turnover. Um, then on the other side, I think Duke, Virginia, North Carolina have to love their season so far. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, think, I think Pitt is going to be pleasantly surprised. They're at four and two. But this is this is going to be a conference with a lot of disappointment. I mean, Florida State, they've looked awful at times, even though they're three and three. Boston College has been a pretty big disappointment, and their quarterback got hurt. Syracuse has been one of the biggest disappointments nationally. Mm-hmm. Virginia Tech, I've talked about this before. I don't, the way the season's going, Fuente, I don't know if we'll be there again. Uh, Miami has had some just putrid play for vast stretches of the season, and Georgia Tech's an abomination. They're one of the worst Power Five conference teams. Yeah, Coach, you got anything to add? No, I think he pretty much summed it up there. I mean, everyone about- says everyone says the Pac-12 is done in the playoff race. I, I'm sorry, that's a deeper league than the ACC. Yeah, well, you know what? I think let's just hop into the Pac-12 from here then, because mm-hmm. I was going to say if they're obviously Clemson is the ACC's one and only shot to make it to the playoff. Does the Pac-12 have anyone that can make the playoff outside of Oregon? Arizona State? Uh, Can I interest you in Utah? I still I still think Utah has a has a chance because like they'll probably get another ranked team or two as the season goes on. Um and they'll get the title game. So I'm not ready to write off Utah or Oregon. Um Arizona State I just I don't see them having enough offense to keep this going. Yeah, I like their defense, but I just they're too vintage Wisconsin-y, and I think was our Wisconsin fans will mm-hmm. know what I what I mean by that. Yep. Um, and unfortunately for U Dub, just two losses already. You can't. They're not coming back from that. Yeah, no, nothing for them. Uh, bigger disappointment: uh, UCLA or Washington State. I think Washington State. I mean, yeah, new quarterback, some other new faces. But speaking of which, Tracy Clay's had, I know, resigned. Uh, resigned. Um, yeah. And apparently, it was because there was um, was it uh, Alex Darcy? I think is his name. I can't remember. Ex- I can't remember his exact name, but one of the defensive assistants was uh, just completely raising hell. And Tracy Clays goes, you know what? If you don't like it, I'll just get out of your, I'll just blank, get out of your way and I'll blank leave and let you have it. And, (laughs) and the guy called him on his bluff and uh, Tracy Clays said, okay, you don't think I'll do it. Bam. Resigned. Monday morning. Well, well, Tracy Clays, Tracy Clays should have done the Larry David. Where you quit in a huff on a Friday and show back up on a Monday. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and just pretend like, like nothing, nothing ever happened. Like nothing ever happened. He did that while writing for SNL. Uh, no, Washington State, it's just it, – they're just bad. But they're also three and three. Bull's not off the picture, out of the picture yet. And as much as we enjoy the Pirates um, – Shenanigans. Character shenanigans is a good way to put it. They're Washington State. They're going to have a thinner roster. They're going to have some years where they look really good and can compete for a title, and then some years where that cycle goes the opposite way. I just think they're between cycles a little bit, and it, it's tough to know. You know what their far- quarterback it, it, situation would be if uh, uh, the obvious, you know, absolutely terrible terrible depressing thing the the death the suicide of Helsinki had to have thrown a little bit of a wrinkle in his quarterback plan oh my gosh yes and not just that but I I think the emotional and psychological toll that takes on the entire team is something that you know uh, has is going to have ramifications 
for a, a long time in, in that program. Um, Agreed. Yeah. So uh, another disappointing team. I thought Colorado would look a little bit better than they have. Yeah, first year coach though, right? Yeah, they've been. So. They've, I, I like mean, Mel. I don't know. I like Mel Tucker a lot, they, and I, been, I thought even with you know they had Montez back. Um, they've been frisky. They've won some games. They knocked off Nebraska. They just they, don't have the horses to compete week in and week out yet. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 the travel schedule for them is particularly tough. <laughs> Just because so, they are so much further east than any other school, they're trending in the right direction. Although it doesn't That's feel true. like it. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's then. Well, head... I mean, should we talk about who's happy? I mean, you have Oregon's obviously happy back in the national picture. Yeah. Arizona think, State's happy. Arizona State's happy. I think Utah's obviously very happy. You get a lot of kind of. What are we doing, fan bases? Oregon State. Two and four through six? Is this an improvement? What do they do it? <laughs> uh, Washington, five and two through seven games. What are we doing? A little bit of that feeling. Stanford, three and three. What are we doing? USC, I think they're they I think USC might be disappointed at a three and three start considering I think some of their fans hope they would go about oh and five <laughs> for, to get rid of they just want to get rid of yeah. Clayton so bad. Yeah. Um I think two secretly happy fan bases. One, not so much, but um, Cal's not much of a secret. I mean, they're four and no. two. They're looking yeah. good. Uh, but Arizona, very quiet four and two. They looked awful in their season debut, uh, playing some pretty good football since. Mm-hmm. It still feels like a shaky uh, at best situation for Sumlin based on just how his teams have some second half collapses, how they – seem allergic to defense at times. Uh, but four and two through six games, if they play like this in the second half, go eight and four, maybe win their bowl game. Uh, I could see some people starting to buy what someone is selling down there. Yeah, that's definitely nothing to sneeze at. Um, let's head over, though, to the Big Ten. Uh, Josh, um, you were in the house for the Penn house. State, Iowa this past weekend. Uh, back in your hometown, uh, it must have been a little bit strange not to stay in your childhood home. Yeah, that was weird. That was weird. Um, what was not strange was seeing Iowa uh, pee all down their leg in classic <laughs> fashion. Uh, let me get to the positives. Uh, defense was phenomenal. A um, hilarious, uh, if it's open, you can run. If it's not, punt. The punter had a wide open lane and panicked and decided to kick it um, and then shanked it like 10 yards out of bounds, gave Penn State great field position, and then a fumble in classic Nate Stanley, Brian Ferentz uh, teamwork. Penn State showing an all-out blitz. Stanley audibles to a run right into their blitzing lane. Uh, Tyler Goodson who is one of the most dynamic players I've seen Iowa have in probably about the last four or five seasons outside of the tight end position, Um, just gets blown up. And, I mean, he's really good. He's going to have a pretty stellar career, but he's also a true freshman and just took a huge wallop and fumbled the ball, set up Penn State with really short field position. So, like, the ineptitude on offense – and special teams gifted Penn State some points. So the defense played phenomenally well to hold up to 17 points. But, like, that was a highlight. The other highlight, uh, one of the best halftime shows I can remember. The band played a show that they called HMB TV for Hawkeye Marching Band TV. They played theme songs to all the hits. Friends, Parks and Rec. The Office, Big Bang Theory, and they had like awesome choreography. So the band in Iowa defense, they brought their A games. Uh, the special teams brought their D minus <laughs> team, if I could be generous. The, the kick coverage was really good. That's why I'm not going to give it an F. Um, but they missed a field goal and had the shank punt. The offense, though, that's the like that's the elephant in the room. Because it, it, it's it, it, the offense is not just an F; 
it it's, is a uh, it, it's a expel, ex, ex, expelled yeah. from school. Yeah. So Michigan basically showed Iowa does not know how to handle blitzes. If you blitz, you are going to blow this team up. If you bring an all out blitz, if you bring eight dudes and just man cover, you're fine because the offensive line is okay, although it's a little bit of a disappointment from what we had in preseason expectations. Um, but they're not good in blitzing situations. Stanley is probably going to audible right to a run into the face of your best player. Uh, they're constantly having the wrong person chip on blitzing plays. So Iowa has this like three headed monster thing that they have the freshman Goodson who he's a little fast speedster. Uh, he's what our over the hill announcer would call a jitterbug. Uh, you have Torin young who is the big power bruiser and you have Makai Sargent who's kind of in between. And Sargent's been the starter, although he's kind of in a slump and not really seeing the holes well. So the starter had nine carries for 18 yards. Well, then they bring in Goodson, who has eight carries for 35 yards to lead the team, although 29 of those yards came on one carry. So the other seven was pretty much a wash. And they have Torin Young, who ran the ball okay, seven carries, 22 yards. But what's stupid is they never have Torin Young out there in – blocking situations he's the power back theoretically he should have the biggest body it'd be the best equipped at getting a body on an extra pass rusher but instead they usually have tyler goodson out there so you're asking a true freshman to know blocking assignments and carries and they have goodson catch quite a few passes out of the backfield and on top of that josh uh, Torn Young threw the best pass block of the entire night when he was out there in pass protection. There was a play in, I forget it was the third or the fourth quarter, when it was he probably threw, the fourth because our it, offense it was, didn't do diddly. Crap it was the fourth the quarter, and he cut block. We didn't do diddly poo. He, he had a perfect cut block on a blitzing linebacker, uh, to uh, and so uh, Stanley gets the ball off. Uh, the guy Smith catches it and who then fumbles but torn young has already gotten up from the block gone to run downfield to help lead block for him and he falls on the fumble it was yeah. <laughs> it was the best you know effort play in the game also uh strange enough torn young uh do you know where he's from josh wisconsin not just wisconsin madison wisconsin yep well there's been some running backs on that roster yeah i don't think he's getting much playing yeah. time at wisconsin so it's just schematically it's really bad um, it's really vanilla, and what frustrates us as fans of Iowa, and Coach can explain this more in depth because he does this for a living, which is there's no rhyme or reason to the play call. It looks like he, Brian Ference is booting up the old Xbox and picking plays at random and going, oh, well, this worked one time or oh this is a fun play or well normally teams run in this situation so i'll call a run but like nothing sets up anything uh a good example of this is once a game until the penn state game so maybe he is learning but uh at least once a game through the first several weeks they would call a jet sweep in which iowa's fastest player uh amir smith marset would go in motion and you never really saw him go in motion other than for the jet sweep. And so by the time Michigan saw it on tape, they just teed off on it and blew it up. And it's like, well, why are you doing that if you're not setting up a fake out of it? Or why don't you do a jet sweep with a different player so that way you don't tee it off that, oh, Smith Marset's there, he went in motion, jet sweep. Like, they don't set anything up. Uh, against Michigan at one point, they did a play-action pass really randomly in the second half when they hadn't run the ball at all in the second half. And all that did was make for a really slow developing play that ended in a sack. So they're not 
building any tempo. They're not doing something to set something up for later in the game. There's no like trick plays. There's nothing inventive about it. And this is where I wanted to segue to you coach. Like how stupid do you have to be to not set something up and like have a rationale to your play calling rather than just grabbing plays at random. Yeah, it almost seems like, um, you know, the more inexperienced, um, just some of the coordinators are not very good, just don't seem to have a flow of the game. And, you know, I think there, you know, there's ways to set other things up. Not And not necessarily, I mean, they could set up jet sweep with, with in other ways. Um, but, um, you know, the most notable way would to be run jet sweep and just run inside zone off of it. Run jet sweep and play action. Run jet sweep and RPO it at the college level. You can do that a lot easier than the high school level. You know, jet sweep is so easy to disguise and mask and 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 use jet motion as window dressing that, um, you know, there's no real excuse for that, especially if you're primarily a, a jet team. Now, there's other things in the pass game. There's other things in the run game that you can do to help yourself and set things up and, and you know, go against formational tendencies. And, and there's there's a lot of things you could break tendency wise, like getting a spread formation and run power. No one really does that. You and all all you would just modify it, and you would probably give up a blocker. But um, really, you just pull and wrap your guard around, and it's just a simple simple power play. I see that quite often. Um, you know, you get in a wide bunch, and and you do some quick screen stuff, and you can also go wide bunch and work to the solo side. You know, there's there's a lot of different things you can do formationally. Um, that look the same but are completely different plays and, and it then throws defenses off because, well, they have to honor the bunch. But then again, you're going to make them honor the run game as well. Um, what are they going to choose? It's kind of, kind of like a pick your poison type thing. And if you're extremely predictable out of these formations and you just run certain plays, then they can – defenses, it's a lot easier for them to adjust and stunt their way um, out of trouble – but if you have a lot of different things you can do um, and then there's, and you create some more opportunities with just simple fixes like motions and, and shifts, then, you know, you help yourself out in that regard. So. Um, and then coach, the other question I had for you. So uh, let's say you call a play and defense comes out with eight men in the box mm-hmm. and all of them are in blitzing lanes. Okay. Do you, what do you do? Do you audible to a run? Do you audible to a quick hitter? Do you just go with the original play call? Because it seems like any time a team very, very, very clearly shows a blitz, Iowa has been audibleizing into run plays, despite having a senior quarterback and a very fast receiving core, when it seems like a – quick hitter, slant something, maybe a very, very quick out um, would have the potential to go the distance since they just have one man to beat. What's the rationale of audibleizing into a run play other than me being biased and saying it's pure stupidity? Yeah, I I think if they're showing the look that you just described, I think audibling into a run is dumb. Um, I would audible into either a screen, uh, middle screen, tunnel screen. There's just something to get the ball out quick, um, because eight across is not gonna is not going to uh, provide you any good opportunities. Um, we're about to go against the team next week. We're on a bye this week, but uh, we're about to go against the team next week that employs the bear front. Which, if those of you who don't know the bear front. It means you have five down linemen covering each offensive lineman um, with a zero nose, uh, two outside shades on the guard, and two outside shades on the tackle, and then two free roaming linebackers. So um, that presents a problem in the run game. Um, and sometimes, there, sometimes, especially on early downs, um, in order to get other things going and get the defense to commit to putting people in the box and to help your passing game, sometimes you just kind of have to – uh, ram yourself into that brick wall um, and then just just show that you're willing to try to run on that box because if you show that you're trying to you're, you're uh, committed to trying to run on that box 
you might get that box more on first down, and that might set you up for a shot play later on down the road. So there's a whole chess match involved um, with that, and I'm not saying you have to check to a run every single time. I'm not saying you need to, you need to turn the hand the ball off 20 times um, up the gut against the eight-man front with guys in blitz lanes, but I, I think sometimes depending on the down distance, field position, things like that, um, you may you may can actually do yourself a favor by by checking to a run. Uh, you may can do yourself a favor by uh, you know allowing yourself an opportunity to uh, take a shot at some point down the road. Well, that gets to another problem that for the Iowa offense, you just said sometimes it's okay to run against that. Well, Iowa ran the ball thirty times against Penn State, but Nate Stanley accounted for six carries. And that means that the 24 carries went to the three-headed monster, eight, seven, and nine carries. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe this is old school, like 1980s, uh, give the guy the ball a whole bunch and you have the heavy lifter. But how do you get in a rhythm with under 10 carries in a game? You you don't. um, But in order to help your run game out, You've also got to be willing to run on traditional non-running downs. Um, like, well, a lot of times lately, first and ten is becoming non-traditional running down. You know, uh, third and third and long is a, is a non-traditional running down. You know, um, those are some things you can help yourself getting into a rhythm by, and that's where you can get a lot of your rush yards, especially in a quarterback rushing game, is on third and long or on third and. I would say medium, which is about five to five to eight, um, and then third and short. It, it's it's either way, but third and short is a heavy rundown, so you may be able to hit your passing game on third and short too. So um, you um, just you know you just got to break tendency a lot. Going back to the audibleizing, um, Iowa has a third year starting senior quarterback. He he should be able to get you into a good look. Um, I heard once uh, I was at a clinic um, and I was listening to um, and you listen to so many coaches at these clinics that you kind of forget exactly who says what, um, but I'm pretty sure it was the offensive coordinator at um, I think, I think it was Phil Longo um, who said it. Don't quote me on that 100%, but he said that as an offensive coordinator, he said, you better have a good quarterback because they are uh, typically leaned on to get you uh, get you right 25% of the time. So uh, the, the, the quarterback is supposed to help you out about, 70, about 25% of the time. The offensive coordinator is responsible for about 75% of the play calls. The quarterback is supposed to help you out on the other 25%. So you have a senior, three-year starter. He should be able to get you into a good play call. Um, and uh, a lot of that's on uh, Nate Stanley, and a lot of that's on the coaches for not arming him with the knowledge of um, what you know what a good play is against certain fronts. So um, it's very odd. I don't, I, you know, I, but I think Brian Ferentz deserves a lot of of criticism here in this regard for not only calling the wrong plays, but not educating Nate Stanley enough to be able to get them out of bad plays and into good ones. Well, that's what I'm worried. I mean, Nate Stanley, you know, does not look like he has improved at all in his three years as a starter. Like he, I, I, he's strangely enough, like he was more athletic when he was a sophomore and he was making more plays that made me, you know, drop my jaw and get so mad at Gary Anderson, letting him leave the state of Wisconsin. But now he looks Okay. Well, that's that's Iowa football. They're the quarterbacks get worse each year. They're in the system. Um, it you know, Drew Tate's best season was his first year. Ricky Stanzi's best yep. season yep. was uh, his second year. Um, although it was his first year as the full time starter, uh, Brad Banks should have won the Heisman in his literal one year. Mm-hmm. as the starter. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not surprised at all. And what's really gross is he has some, like, major 
fans in Iowa that have taken to calling him Nate the Great as he's closing in on some all-time passing stats. It's like he's a freaking compiler. Like having 450 yards against Ball State and like four touchdowns and then can't do jack crap against Michigan. Like, I'm sorry. I'd rather have him show up for a couple games of importance. He is not even on the same planet as Chuck Long in terms of being an all-important Iowa quarterback. He is the Joel Stave of <laughs> Iowa quarterbacks. That's a good way to put it. Um, a compiler who happened to be there when the rest of the team was very good. That was another question I wanted to ask you guys tonight. So I'm just going to get into it now. Um, what What do you think is the best overall unit in the country? I'm talking about like, some teams either like defensive line or linebackers has there been one team or one unit that has really uh stood out to you guys yet because there are there there are there are a couple things that i noticed and josh one of them when i was watching iowa penn state um both of those teams have outstanding defensive lines um i expected a lot more out of iowa's offensive line i thought they were getting pushed around but that is a a a credit to penn state um in their defensive line because they played uh quite the game but i think that um you know i i I, you know watching aj epinesa and the rest of that defensive line i think iowa does have one of the best defensive lines in the whole country yeah they started a little slow they they've picked it up the last few weeks to to say for sure um i think that between the quarterback play and the running back play, Ohio State's backfield, I think, would be on any short list that you're compiling, Matt, for best units. That's a great, great answer. Coach, do you have any any thoughts there? Um, as far as defensive lines go, you have to include Auburn. Um, yes. With Derek Brown, Marlon Alexander, and, uh, and Dontavious Russell. Uh, receivers... You have to look at Alabama. Yeah, and Alabama's receivers are we're, we're gonna, are probably in my top three. Yeah, so sure. you got you got Rugs, Devontae Smith, Jerry Judy, um, and then Clemson, Justin Ross, Irv Smith Eli as Rogers. a tight end. Like, yeah, Irv Smith is Irv Smith's in the league, isn't he? No, that's OJ Howard's in the league. Is Irv, Irv Smith Sm- in the league now too? Yeah, he got drafted by Minnesota. Really. I'm a year yeah. behind. Well, now I'm embarrassed. Either way, it doesn't matter. They, <laughs> they have good. some 6'5", 265-pound tight end who's an Adonis. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so you, you got to say that. Uh, you got to look at LSU secondary uh, with mm-hmm. uh, Grant Delpit, Jacoby Stevens, um, and uh, uh, that crew. Uh, then you got to look, um, you know, quarterbacks, you know, well, I think I think I like I like Josh's view looking at it as a, not just quarterback, but looking at it as a backfield, as a backfield, as a yeah, backfield. So, so backfield, backfield Clemson, uh, Etienne, and, and Trevor Lawrence. Mm-hmm. They're certainly not the reason why Clemson is struggling. Um, you've got to look. Uh, you got to look at Georgia with Jake Fromm and DeAndre Swift. Mm-hmm. You got to look um, right now, although it's not dynamic as far as star power but they're they're extremely productive mostly led by jtt you got to look at wisconsin with uh, what jack Cohn is doing um jackie he, heisman i know right um you got to look at um yeah you, know, you got to look at the production ohio state's getting out of their backfield um you got to look at oklahoma uh their backfield uh trey sermon and jalen hurts who jalen hurts is more of the tailback uh, quarterback all wrapped into one, but you Don't got also about Kennedy got a, Brooks there too. Exactly, and then you look at Oklahoma's receiving core, um, with uh, led by C.D. Lamb, which is incredible. Uh, and then linebackers, um, honestly, they all. I mean, I can't think of a. I'll, I'll of, take I'll take I'll take Cal's linebackers just because you get Evan Weaver, and Evan Weaver is potentially the best all around defensive player in the country. Yeah, I just. It's just such a no-name group with the with the linebackers. I always I always kind of struggle to figure out who the best units are there because Wisconsin's usually... linebackers this year are truly outstanding. Um, mm-hmm. That group is um, one of the best linebacking units they've had in a while, and they've had some really 
really good units in the in this past decade this might be the best of the bunch um i want to continue though in the big 10 we need to uh so let's head over to the big 12 really quick we've been talking about oklahoma they've looked uh amazing i one of the questions i asked in the acc was josh was is there anyone who could push clemson my question in the big 12 is the same thing is there anyone who can push oklahoma and is that team baylor they play some damn good defense, to say the least. I certainly want wouldn't want to play this Baylor team. I still they are starting to yeah. succumb to injuries, though. I I get the feeling that this might be a a short lived uh, trip in the top twenty five for them. Yeah, um, that wouldn't surprise me based on those injuries. But I still think that. This Cyclone team I also like, and they're rounding into four. They just beat the snot out of TCU in West Virginia in back-to-back weeks. Uh, They really should have won that Baylor game. Um, And outside of just the one hiccup against Iowa, they've played some really good ball uh, after stubbing their toe a little bit against UNI. I mean, they, they dropped 70 points on a team. They're rounding into form. I think they'll be a tough out. The one downside, of course, is they have to travel to Norman this year. But uh, I, I think the Cyclones are still in a really good position to give Oklahoma some fits. And, and obviously, you know, Joe Tessitore and his Texas Longhorn Love Affair. Yeah, Coach. Well, speaking of Texas, I think that the Big 12 has the biggest middle class of any conference. They, I think they have one team at the top and then eight teams – in the middle that on any given weekend, Kansas state can beat Texas, West Virginia could beat Oklahoma state, et cetera, et cetera. I feel like, you know, except with the, maybe the exception of Texas tech, but even they haven't looked terrible so far, at least when they're in Lubbock, um, they are, they're three and O at home and O and three on the road, but you know, it, it, it's pretty wide open there in the middle of the big 12. Yeah, I picture Big 12 um, as the the dad sitting on the couch, which is Oklahoma, and the kids fighting, the five kids fighting um, in the living room floor while dad watches TV, and that's all the other teams fighting for that number two spot to play against Oklahoma in the title game. So um, very interesting none, nonetheless. Um, I think any of those – I think any of those teams can – could compete with Oklahoma, um, could give Oklahoma some fits, although I think Oklahoma would come out victorious, and I think Oklahoma's going to win um, the Big 12 championship, and I still stand behind that. But I think these teams are starting to prove that they're worthy of being in the game and being in the conversation. Um, I, I think Oklahoma State's always there. Uh, Texas is, is starting to um, is starting to prove Tessator right. Um, they're not quite there yet, but they're not, they're not Texas is back. That's not necessarily true either. Um, I like Baylor. I like, I really like what Baylor's doing. Um, I I think they've kind of turned it around a little bit and I think they're heading trending in the right direction is as much as that pains us to say. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Matt rule is doing a tremendous job down there. Uh, Chris Kleiman is doing, uh, doing a good job at Kansas state. But, you know, as of right now, they're just still Kansas State. So it's going to take him some time to kind of build that program. But he's going to be kind of the Bronco Mendenhall of the Big 12. Um, give him time. Mm. And he I will. I like that analogy. Give, give him time. Be patient with him. And I think he can build something that could – that could compete in the upper echelon of the uh, of the Big 12. Um, the Kansas Jayhawks, I think, are – they a little better. They, they've improved. Um, each and every week, mm-hmm. and they're getting better slowly but surely. Um, West Virginia started out really slow, and they've looked much better in the past few weeks. Yeah, t- those and are two teams that Iowa State dropped them. Yeah, but and you know, but they for they looked really bad to start the year. They had a couple weeks they actually looked competent. Um, <laughs> so, well, hell yeah, and I'm Iowa the... State should <laughs> drub them. Iowa, Iowa State yeah. is 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 is. <laughs> is better than them but but like Hell, i said on any if competence the baseline let's talk about maryland terrapins <laughs> no please no <laughs> no um well uh actually speaking of though 
one team we didn't mention in the Big Ten was Minnesota, who is still unbeaten at six and zero. Oh. Yeah. Um, potentially, you know, I, I mean, I have no idea how to feel about <laughs> this Minnesota team because it feels like it's all smoke and mirrors to me. But um, their defense isn't half bad. They don't really excel at anything. Yeah, um, I suppose. I even dug deep. I was like, oh, are they one of the – like, are, do they have a monster turnover margin? No. They have a plus one turnover margin. But the only thing I could say that they really excel at is they're hardly penalized. That There's only two Big Ten teams that penalize less than Minnesota. So they do that well. Um, Tanner Morgan hasn't passed for a whole lot of yards, but he's got a nice split, 14 touchdowns to three inter- Exceptions and Rodney Smith has put together a nice season, but yeah, I mean, even their defense isn't like world beaters. They're pretty average in everything. The only thing I could say about them is they're playing hot. They are obviously buying what PJ Fleck is selling. They have to be super confident. They're racking up the wins. They're going to blow out Rutgers uh, in their next game. I mean, they, they should be able, Nebraska. They should, yeah, they should be able to beat Maryland, um, especially with that game being at home. I think Maryland is a, a, a tad scarier at home. Um, but, yeah, they should run this thing to 8-0. And sometimes, like, teams just get confident and they play above their stats and they are the sum of their parts. So I think Gophers – are a contender in the West. They have a pretty favorable schedule uh, with Rutgers and Maryland coming up. You know, say Iowa loses to Purdue, well, cross them off. They get Wisconsin in the finale at home late in the season. I mean, that could be two feet of snow. And for all we know, uh, over the course of the season, what happens if JTT and Jack Cohn are hurt and not playing in that game? So can't write off Minnesota. Or that could that could be essentially the Big Ten West title game. That if. could be. Um, I, I will say this, though. Minnesota has Rutgers next. I had to get this in the show somehow. Uh, Rutgers stats against Indiana mm. as, uh, as a fun read for you, gentlemen. Here's some, here's some inept football for you. Uh, first downs, six. Third down efficiency, 0 for 11. Fourth down efficiency, 0 for 1. Rushing yards, 74. It's not bad. 33 rush attempts, 74 yards. Not awful. One turnover. They actually won the turnover margin plus one. A little bit of a hiccup through the air. Um, They somehow went 5 of 13 through the air for one yard. Uno. One solo yard. Yes, uh, this is not a service academy. This is not a triple option Georgia Tech team. This is, uh, yeah, I mean, Johnny Langan, what can I say? Here are the receiving numbers. Aaron Young, three receptions, four yards. Bo Melton, one reception, minus one yard. And Paul Woods, that sounds like a golfer's name, uh, one reception, negative two yards. It's Tiger's little brother. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what plays they're drawing up, but that's not – much downfield passing no it's really not oh goodness Rutgers the State University of New Jersey well guys um before we head out we'll quickly run through the group of five um the American like I said it earlier they have more teams in the top 25 than the ACC and that doesn't even include uh Central Florida uh, Cincinnati's at 21. Um, they are off to a five and one start. Their lone loss on the year being to Ohio State and SMU six and zero for the first time since 1982. Josh, ponies, po- ponies, uh, playing well in the field, looking good while doing it. And yeah, who's the, who's their coach again? Uh, pretty pretty sure it's uh, Sonny Dykes. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure we thought that was all gonna work out. Pretty sure we thought Texas Tech was stupid for not hiring the son of one of their all-time legends Mm -hmm. uh i I think he kind of knows texas football yeah (laughs) you don't say Hmm. um elsewhere in the conference temple uh defeated 
uh, Temple defeated uh, ranked teams in consecutive weeks for the first time since uh, like since the first time since Bill Cosby was there. I think it was school well, history. I think I saw that oh. on the crawl. Well then, well they called some good <laughs> ball plays. I tell you, I tell you what, they just called some good ball plays, and they're, they're, just, they're just so good. Um, my adopted team, ECU, uh, they won the bye last week. Yeah. Okay. Um, 0 2 in conference, not looking great, but 3 and 3 overall. Uh, UConn, one of one of the, one of the, the worst Panthers teams won. in the country. Um, mm-hmm. to the surprise of s- specifically zero people on this podcast. No, Tulane uh, looking good. Uh, of course, the middies. We middies. kind of expected a down season, four and one. Mm-hmm. Memphis five and one. Only uh, you know they okay. they lost to Temple, but uh, hang on, hang on. I, I'm getting a transmission. Uh, Houston had four more players redshirt. <laughs> the Dana Holgerson experience is off to a great start there. Is in, he playing his son? I, I it's his college basketball. Like, what is this? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so yeah. Um, but um, outside of the American, uh, in the Mountain West, another year, another dominant Boise State team, but there've been some some cracks in the armor recently. Um, but yeah, their their point differential isn't the most impressive. To no, say the least. And coach, I'm worried that we're about to say uh, bye bye in, conf- in conference games. By the way, yeah, our we're about to say bye bye to our old friend Mike Bobo. Uh, two and yeah, five he, for the Rams, yeah, and just he, he, listless. His health is deteriorating. It's just it's getting bad for him. I think he just. I think it's time. Uh, it, it, as, as much as you hate to see it, it, it's it's time. Maybe, maybe he can go just take over the offensive coordinator job at at Georgia. He might do a better job with that. I think he should just drive up the road and be the offensive coordinator at Colorado with uh, old Georgia alum, or uh, sorry, or old Georgia coach Mel Tucker, Wisconsin alum. Mel Tucker. Yeah, yeah, he he could do that, or him, or he could go with his buddy. Uh, him and Kirby are really good friends and ex teammates. Speaking about the Mountain West, you guys want to hear a very very fun and interesting stat? Do we have any other choice? No. Okay. So generally, turnover margin. The more plus you are, you figure the better the team, right? Mm. Uh, unless there's like a truly outsider game where it just kind of throws your stats off. Well, thanks to picking off Arkansas five times, San Jose State had a little outlier of a game, which means they're actually leading the country in turnover margin, yet they sit at three and three <laughs> overall uh, and have a negative point differential. So, that's a little goofy. That's why that's a useful stat, but not the greatest stat <laughs> in the world. Um, yeah. But hey, they're three and three. That's an improvement for San Jose State. So yeah, a couple of teams I love there. Um, I think Fresno State's having a bit of a disappointing year. I think we expected a little bit more from them um, in uh, um, in their in their their second year under this coaching regime. Um, UNLV has has been listless in conference, but they beat Vanderbilt. I was unfortunately in the house for the game. It was one of the saddest showings I have seen uh, in a while. It was really pathetic. You know, they didn't just beat Vanderbilt. They beat them down. They should schedule Ole Miss and Tennessee. Maybe they'd have a better record. I think BYU tried to do that already. Oh, God, BYU. Let's talk about the independents. Um, well, I mean, the independents, man the freaking new mexico state is truly atrocious like truly truly atrocious i I mean they it it, there must be something political where new mexico will never let them in they need to be in the mountain west where they need to be fcs because independent is there's a a common theme between umass and new mexico state Mm -hmm. And, and byu like I was about the last person to continue to say, well, you know, shiitake uh, seems like they overachieve. Well, they're two and one start and impressive wins at Tennessee and USC has totally spiraled, blown out by Washington, lost on the road to Toledo, and then lost on the road at South Florida, a game that they totally pulled uh 
they they pulled a defeat from the jaws of victory. I mean, now they got Boise State. Good luck in that one. At Utah State, Utah State's playing all right. Even Liberty has <laughs> showed more than this BYU team the last few weeks. Uh, the shiitake <laughs> the shiitake experiment might not have too many more weeks left. The shiitake mushroom experiment. Yeah, they might be they might be getting out the truffle pig and looking for a new <laughs> mushroom for their team. Oh lord. Um, okay. Well then, uh, <laughs> let's. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, Sun Belt. I, I'm not sure. Belt. There's, the Fun Belt. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, not sure that there's really anyone who can push Appalachian State. That team is dang good. Dang yeah, I mean, Lu- Louisiana played about as good as you could against them and still had seven points and mm-hmm. lost. I mean, App State is uh, – they're just clicking right now. They're nationally ranked, and they look really, really good. Um, not that they can push them in any way, but uh, Louisiana Monroe, nice little start in their division. Yeah. Yeah, and Co- yeah, and Coastal Carolina opposite, zero and two to start the year, but they showed some flashes. They make it through the first half of the season three and three, so that'd be kind of a nice story if the Shanties could have a nice second half well, swing. And, but who knows? Coach, your 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 squad, your Georgia State squad, uh, might be the second best team in the whole conference. Yeah, they're starting to play like it. Um, they took it to Coastal Carolina um, last week, and 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 I was very very impressed. Yeah, and then um, in the MAC, man, it is a cluster. It is an absolute cluster in the MAC this season, Josh. Um, it is. Uh, I mean, Kent State and Ball State are leading the divisions. Really? Well, well, well Kent State has an amazing point differential in conference games. So yes, you, you got to be thinking like, okay, well, what are they doing right? And then you see, oh. They played Bowling Green and Akron. Mm-hmm. Bowling Green, by the way, who just pulled off the biggest upset <laughs> in point differential wise in a very long time. They were twenty eight and a half point dogs and pulled off the win this past week against Toledo. Yeah, so I mean, can't really say too much about Kent State. They need to play a, a little bit better competition before we say that the hot start is worth a damn. And then Ball State, I mean, we all had – this is like one of the worst teams in the conference. So you got to wonder, well, where did this come from other than Muncie, Indiana? And when you look at their game so far and their 2-0 and start, well, they were Eastern Michigan, my adopted team, a game that Ball State rallied in, and Northern Illinois, who – has really struggled this season. So Ball State, maybe I'm willing to buy the start a little bit. Uh, both wins are on the road. They get Toledo, who is expected to be the one of the best teams next. So that might be the, the make or break game to buy the Ball State squad. But yeah, the Mac East is just an absolute disaster with Ohio and Buffalo not living up to expectations. Mm-mm. And the West is a maybe Ball State has put it together. We'll see. But my adopted team, Eastern Michigan, uh, rough, rough going. They started out three and one, a win at Illinois. Looked like a bowl was um, theirs for the taking if they took care of business against Central Michigan, kind of an up and down team, and Ball State, who we expected to be pretty bad, lost both of them. So they're three and three without a win in conference for them to now make a bowl. They got to figure out how to navigate wins in a lot of these games, because you can't just be six and six in the Mac and make sure you're getting there. They have Akron who's awful. They have Northern Illinois who's struggling. Unfortunately, both of those are on the road. They have Buffalo who we thought would be good, but is winless in the Mac. Western Michigan, like, I I don't know. I'm getting panicked. I'm getting panicked for my adopted team. Yeah. They got to string some wins together. Um, Well, finally, Coach, Conference USA has had some really 
really good teams come out of it and they have one of the worst teams in the whole country in the rice owls <laughs> but um coach this weekend is going to be one of the games of the season uh southern miss the mustard buzzards get to head to ruston to take on louisiana tech those are probably yeah. uh two of the best teams in the whole conference uh definitely the two best teams in the west um uh with north texas having a disappointing season now mason fine going down um mm-hmm. cusa though cusa has been a lot of fun so far this year yeah it has been um and, and there's been a lot of um uh, a lot of really good football a lot of really competitive football and, and i'm i'm just uh you know i'm just impressed and i think um honestly i think southern miss is going to continue to surprise a bunch of folks within their conference and i think they're going to be a lot more successful than than a lot of people were giving them credit for preseason i'll tell you one team that i like in kusa who's that weston kentucky i mean they're four oh, two three and oh in conference opening day loss to central arkansas fcs their only other loss that red hot louisville team we liked they beat defending champion uab Last two weeks, Old Dominion Army, they've given up 11 total points. They're playing some great defense. They're a surprise team. I really like it. And then another surprise team. How about the Kiffinator? Kiffin. 0-2, 0-2 start, blown out by the Buckeyes at Central Florida. Haven't lost since. Now, none of their wins are too impressive because they've been – Charlotte, Middle Tennessee State, and FCS team. But they did beat the Ball State team on the road that we talked about. They get Marshall next. They get that game tomorrow. That might be kind of the measuring stick game because even though they're not world beaters this year, we still always like what Doc Holliday's doing, and, and that's kind of a prove them game. So they run that fifth straight victory. Maybe we got to start looking at the Kiffinator. We might. All right. Well, I think that is going to do it for us here on our mid-season review. Uh, Josh, any final words? We did it. What we, did we do? We didn't talk about good old Arkansas. You guys, I, we, I just, we mentioned them when we talked about San Jose State. I know. I just, I'm getting worried. I don't, I don't think they can make. The SEC title game anymore. Uh, we thought they would at the beginning of the season. Things were looking good there for a while, but some hard luck. And they're currently 0 and 3 in conference 2 and 4. And I don't, I just don't see it happening. I, I think that this is going to be one of those classic cases of the most talented team in the conference just can't get over the hump. I, I think Arkansas is going to have to settle for maybe like the Cotton Bowl or something, but it uh, seems like the playoff shine has has left Fayetteville, unfortunately. It's, it's a sad day. It is very sad. Uh, I have a fun stat to end. Do we have to hear it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wisconsin has given up zero extra points this season. <laughs> Well, that's wow. that's a fun stat. They've given up four touchdowns. They've given up one two-point conversion. But they have not given up an extra point yet this season. Huh. Bizarre. Bizarre. And with that, uh, that's going to do it for us tonight. So on behalf of our own offensive coordinator here in the Music City, the coach, Coy Burton, and our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook, up there in the Windy City. This is the professor in Nashville saying so long and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. Whoopee. Suey. Suey. Thanks for listening to the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. To get in touch with the show, email us at illegalmotionpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at illegal underscore motion and check out our Facebook page.